I'm Jordan Belfort, and this is Sales School. Hey guys, JB in the house here for your daily motivation slash skills training. And as promised, today's topic is going to be the construction of a loop. It's like sort of the sort of the actual, like, you know, the step-by-step, -step, the logical side of looping, how it works, why it works, and how you construct the loop from start to finish, right? So there's basically two things to know about a loop, right? Number one is that every loop is in response to getting hit with an objection. So the, the, the loop is always, I can't fucking write, is this a little objection? It's brought to you objection, right? So a loop is a response to someone saying, let me think about it, let me call you back, it's a bad time of year, right? It's Santa Claus, the fucking tooth fairy, the whole thing, right? So remember, this, the, the, the idea is this phenomenon called objection hopping. So, what happens is, is when you answer an objection, right, in, in, the, in the looping process, what typically happens is they'll start off saying, yeah, it sounds good, Jordan, let me think about it. And then you run a loop, and then all of a sudden, rather than having to think about it, say, oh, yeah, well, it really sounds great. I just got to talk to my wife, right? And then you overcome that with the loop. You say, oh, yeah, 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 oh, perfect. Just, can I call you back in 15 minutes? And they, that's the next one. And they go on and on. They hop objections, right? And the reason people do that, the reason people hop from one to the next, is because in truth, all of these objections were merely smoke screens for what? A lack of certainty, the big C. You hadn't had a high enough level of certainty for either one, two, three, or all three of the three tenths, right? Or perhaps you live with someone with an incredibly high action threshold. So in other words, remember, so action threshold represents, right, the sum of someone's buying beliefs about, you know, taking action, trusting people. Uh, my best decision is a quick decision. Overall, I think that I can trust most people, that salespeople aren't out to rip me off. That's a low action threshold person. A high action threshold person is, I don't trust salespeople one bit. I need to think things through. I got to do my research, right? People with those types of beliefs will have a high action threshold, meaning that their collective level of certainty for the three tens must be really, really high. In other words, for someone to buy, imagine, let me, let me draw this out for you in a graph. So in other words, imagine this is certainty, right? Is a, a one and a 10, right? And as you go down the sale, there's certainty, you go down the straight line, the certainty rises, right? So imagine that someone has an action threshold, right? That is a 10, they're very high. That means until you get their collective level of certainty above this, until they're that certain. So if they have, let's say, a nine action threshold, the sum's gotta be essentially like a 9.1 or higher on the collective certainty scale. Three tens, logic and emotion. If it's below that, they say, eh, I'm not certain enough to act in spite of my beliefs. So my beliefs about not taking action are stronger than my certainty that I'm so sure that this time I'm right, that yes, even though I don't trust most salespeople, I'm sure of this one. So they're that sure that their action, that their, essentially their level of certainty exceeds this predisposition not to be certain, not to buy, right? Versus the someone with a low action threshold like me, where you get me to like a seven, eight, seven, medium, seven on the product, eight on the salesperson, a seven on the company, but I have a six action threshold. So I'm like, yeah, most of the time I think it's okay, so I'll buy. So people with higher action thresholds need to go further down the straight line. They require more loops because now we're going back, watch. So if you go back, that's what I first said. I said, watch, an, uh, a loop happens in response to an objection. So notice someone answers an objection, right? And so someone gives you an objection, right? What's the first thing you do? I'll show you. With your initial loop, I skipped the page, I'm not gonna waste paper now, right? So with your first loop, loop number one, right? It starts with the process of deflection. Meaning we don't even answer the objection head on. So if someone says, well, it sounds good, Jordan, but let me think about it. So, we, so now, now the reason I, I use that compound answer, it sounds good, but, 
let me think about it, is because most of the time that's what you get. When you ask for the order, so they'll just say, let me think about it. They say, oh, it sounds okay. So they'll give you some indication of, of where they stand, but they'll qualify, oh yeah, it sounds pretty good. Let me call you back. So typically your initial objection will be a compound answer, right? So when we deflect, all it means is that we essentially don't address the second part of the compound answer. Hang on. It sounds good, right? So watch it. It sounds good, but let me think about it. I need to think about it, right? So compound answer, right? So what we do with deflection is I focus on this, okay? And I sort of deflect. I said, I hear what you're saying. I said, but let me ask you a question. Now, does the idea really make sense to you? Do you like the idea? I address this aspect, right? Because remember, it's at this point, it's all about the fact that they're not at a high enough level of certainty about your product first. Because remember, people, unless they love your product, they're not gonna buy from you. So it doesn't matter yet about you or the product. They can trust you. They say, listen, Jordan, I really trust you, but I think your product sucks. They're not gonna buy anyway. So what's the point of addressing the trust factor when you haven't established first that they love your product? That's why that's the first thing we always do, right? So our initial loop starts with deflection, we deflect the objection, and I just say, you know, does the idea make sense? Do you like the idea, right? And then I run this pattern, right, starting with my first, so watch, so it starts with deflection, I then have my first pattern, where I essentially build on the airtight logical case that I framed in my initial presentation. I then go to my forest gum pattern, right, that second where I sell myself, and then I resell the company. So that's all in this middle part of the loop. And then I transition into a close and I ask for the order. So in other words, a loop always begins with A, either deflecting the objection in the first one, or then in the second one, you're actually gonna answer the objection, but I'll never, I never will just say, I hear what you're saying you know, about, about your wife, but just give me one shot and buy from you. There's, there's always something in between, and what's in between is where the magic happens. This is the magic. It's what you say after you say, I hear what you're saying, but, but, but let me say this. And when you say, let me say this, what you're doing is you're filling in the blanks of your airtight logical case and making it that much stronger. So for those people, watch. So let's say that your initial presentation got someone to like a six or a seven on the certainty scale, but they have a nine action threshold. You have to raise that level of certainty. You have to. There's no way they're gonna buy unless they're more certain about all three tens. So, the re so what we do is we run the loop to move them down the line to a higher level of certainty. And then we ask for the order again. So we raise that, so we use the objection as an opportunity to loop back into presentation mode, rebuild more certainty, and ask for the order again. So the patterns you run, the things that you say, are designed to make your product so they understand it's that much more awesome than you already thought. You're making it that much more awesome in the prospect's mind, and also when it comes to emotional certainty, you're starting to future pace them on how it will make them feel in the future. When they are going to the vacation rental, driving the car down the road with the wind blowing in their hair, or have the insurance policy and no longer worried about getting sick because their kids will be taken care of no matter what, you get it? So you're always future pacing to create emotional certainty about all three tenths. So when you run your first loop and ask for the order again, they might now, because you've raised the level of certainty, but it's not high enough, they'll hop to a new objection. Now, on the second objection, when you loop, you're always, again, you're going to answer the objection head on. So they hit you with, now let me talk to my wife, right? So you're going to say, I understand you want to talk to it, but let me say this. And then you can go to some of the rebuttals I've given you and pick out that rebuttal about why they don't really need to talk to their wife. But then you would never, ever go from answering the objection to the close. Something has to be in between. Because remember, the objection was a smokescreen for a lack of certainty. That's what it was. So there has to be something in between that does what? That raises their level of certainty. So you, are, you answer the objection, then you go loop back again, and you resell the product again, 
you resell yourself again, more emotion this time, future pacing, resell the company, and now you can lower the action threshold using that pattern. So now what you're doing is you're attacking it from two levels now. You're raising up their level of certainty and you're lowering their action threshold. If it happens to cross over where well, you've lowered their action threshold enough so that their level of certainty is higher, that's when they buy. Now, if on that loop they don't buy, then what do you do? You'll get hit with another objection. So you're going to answer that objection once again. You'll loop back, create even more certainty, and now you'll add on pain. You'll lower the pain threshold. When we introduce pain into the, or we say reintroduce pain, right? What it does is by having someone be essentially insinuated into the pain they're feeling, it will temporarily lower their action threshold even further. And again, because you're now also, you're also always raising certainty, lowering action threshold, and if at that point their level of certainty in exceeded their action threshold, that's when they'll buy right there. So again, it could be three loops. How many loops do you run? It could be three, four, five, doesn't matter. The point is, every time you run a loop, what you're doing is, is you are increasing their collective level of certainty, lowering their action threshold, and the methodology is simply by taking this objection and using that as the opportunity to essentially increase certainty, lower action threshold, and transition to a close. So the loop will always end with a close, and it always begins with answering the objection. That's how you construct a loop, all right? Now, will it work well? It will if what you say in here actually makes sense. So you can't be saying nonsense. So you actually have to come up with, why I always say, work on your patterns, prepare yourself. Know what you're going to say. You have to be able to make three airtight logical cases and three airtight emotional cases for each of the tens. When you can do that and you know how to lower the action threshold using straight line technology, it's pretty hard not to be able to close anyone who's closable. All right? That's your lesson for the day. I love you all. Tomorrow we'll go back to motivation. So kick some ass today. Close your deals. Be ethical. Be honest. But make a ton of money. Talk tomorrow.